On secular humanism, whether secular humanism is a religion and the constitutional ramifications thereof. This will be a three-part presentation. In the first part, we'll give a, a little bit of background information on the nature of the controversy surrounding secular humanism and why we should discuss it and what it means for our society today. This part will also include background information on the United States Constitution and its underlying legal philosophies, and we will also address the uh, philosophies that stem from secular humanist thought and how those philosophies interact with the underlying philosophies of the Constitution. The second part, we will examine uh, United States court cases regarding religion in general and secular humanism. We'll look at cases that define the scope of what can legally be considered a religion, and we'll also look at cases that specifically address secular humanism and whether it will fit the legal definition of a religion. And then the third part of the presentation, we'll discuss some policy considerations regarding secular humanism and the Constitution, and specifically the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, which is what gives us the separation of church and state. Much of the controversy surrounding secular humanism comes from a concern that secular humanism has become a sort of de facto state religion, both in public schools and in the public sphere generally. And critics of secular humanism have made accusations that secular humanism is not just another competing ideology in a marketplace of different ideologies, but that the, the idea of secular humanism is to actually force traditional religions out of the marketplace of ideas and replace them in public discourse. And now for a little bit of background information on the Constitution and its underlying philosophy, which is natural law philosophy. Um, the writers of the Constitution were not saying, here is a list of rights that we will grant to you as your new government, granted to our subjects, the people. It said that this is a list of rights that all people possess just by the virtue of being human. And that's exactly what they meant whenever they said that all of these rights are inalienable. It means that the government can't grant them or take them away, just that you have them on the basis of being a person. Um, the legal philosopher and natural law thinker, uh, Thomas Aquinas, he said that an unjust law is no law at all. And that goes a long way in explaining what natural law is and how the state is limited in its ability to truly make law. And now down to the second bullet point. Natural law is the outcome of man's quest for an absolute standard of justice. This statement ties natural law to absolutism. Natural law is an absolutist philosophy. Absolute means that reality is unchanging and it is objective, not subjective. Whereas relativism, the opposing thought to absolutism, would say that knowledge and truth and morality exist only in relation to uh, culture or society or historical context, and that thus truth is not absolute. And down to the last bullet point, that the concept of natural law is central to the Western tradition of thought about morality, politics, and law. That statement in there is included to show the inherent link between all of the Western tradition and absolutism, and that Western thought comes from absolutism and not relativism. And this statement was made by Robert P. George. He's one of the foremost natural law thinkers. He is a law professor at Princeton, and he also has a fellowship position on the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. Natural law is an absolutist philosophy, whereas secular humanism is a relativist philosophy. If they are not absolutes, then each individual is absolute and the sole judge of his own action. For the humanist, morals are purely a matter of preference. With such a relativist symbol embedded in American life, totalitarianism cannot be far behind. And what the author means here is that relativists are willing to balance the rights of some against the rights of others to try to attain the greatest possible good, whereas absolutists would say that we can't do a balancing test on rights and that everyone has rights which we cannot alienate from that individual. We can't trample on their rights to try to create a greater good. Um, a good example of why the author would say that totalitarianism is what results whenever you have relativist thought would be the Soviet Union in 1917, when during what is called the Red Terror, the communist revolutionaries decided that they would execute the entire class that they deemed to be the bourgeoisie, which was the rich landowners and businessmen. Um, the communist revolutionaries thought that all the wars were fought under these people's directions and on behalf of these people for their own benefit. So if they could just get rid of the bourgeoisie, then they could end war, and it would be a much better outcome for everyone. By killing this class of people now, they would save many, many, many more people down the line. 
and that if they could spread communism to other countries, then they would eventually create world peace. A relativist would say that they could execute those uh, the bourgeoisie to do that, whereas an absolutist would say that we cannot execute an entire class of people just based on the thought that we might be able to have a better political outcome down the road. And next we'll examine two secular humanist documents to get some secular humanist views in their own words, see how they would describe themselves. There are two main secular humanist organizations in the United States. One of them is the American Humanist Association, and the other is the Council for Secular Humanism. The first document that we'll look at is called a Humanist Declaration, and it comes from the Council for Secular Humanism, and it was drafted in 1980. The first bullet point, uh, that they are opposed to absolutist morality. We've already discussed that at length. I just wanted to put that in there to establish their position on, on absolutism versus relativism and that they fall on the side of relativism. On to the second point, humanists support social justice. Social justice is a really popular phrase right now, and you'll hear it a lot in public discourse, but what does social justice actually mean? According to Professor Fraser, who is a supporter of social justice, the term usually has one of two meanings. One of them is the redistribution of wealth, and the other is the recognition of minority rights. And as to the first possible definition of social justice, that social justice means the redistribution of wealth, well, that means socialism. When the state confiscates money from some and gives it to others on the basis that they have deemed that it's unfair for some people to be wealthy and successful and for some people to be less wealthy, that's socialism. Such a redistribution of wealth would be in line with collectivist philosophy, which basically means that we as a society should all work together and all equally share the profits of the society, as opposed to an individualist viewpoint, which would say that individuals who do well and earn a lot should be able to keep their money. And that collectivist viewpoint is the underlying philosophy of communism and socialism. And as to the second possible definition of social justice, that social justice means the recognition of minority rights, that is open to two different interpretations. The first of them would be that we as a society are simply obligated to give equal treatment to minority groups and to give them equal opportunity to succeed and, that would, and to not discriminate against them. And that definition would be completely congruent with natural law philosophy and totally congruent with constitutional law. But the second possible definition of recognition of minority rights, which would not be congruent with natural law philosophy, would be that we should engage in affirmative action as a means to recognize the rights of minorities. Um, that would say that instead of saying the person with the best grades should get into college, it would give people extra points for being of minority status. And so that sort of a recognition creates different social classes of people and says that some are, are more deserving of certain benefits than others. Natural law would never allow that because it treats everyone as an equal individual. Secular humanists oppose any tyranny over the mind of man. Um, this and the second bullet point uh, regarding the separation of church and state, wherever one religion or ideology is established and given a dominant position in the state, minority opinions are in jeopardy. Uh, these viewpoints are very congruent with the natural law and, and the constitutional law regarding the separation of church and state. And specifically about this one, it says wherever one religion or ideology is established, uh, according to this document right here, the secular humanists are not seeking to become a primary ideology of the United States. And on to the last bullet point, uh, democratic decision-making based upon majority rule and respect for minority rights and rule of law. Again, that sounds to be very congruent with the natural law and with the Constitution, though the idea, uh, they do say rule of law, which would indicate a respect for constitutional law, Though the idea of majority rule, uh, that would just be the tyranny of the majority. The majority's rule needs to be tempered by the Constitution, and it does seem from this statement that secular humanists would agree with that idea. The Seven Themes of Secular Humanism is a document published in 2003 by the American Humanist Association, which is the other really prominent humanist organization in the United States. Um, Three of these themes are going to be particularly relevant to the Constitution, to the Establishment Clause and the separation of church and state. The Establishment Clause reads that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion. 
The first theme of secular humanism endorses a belief in rationalism and empiricism. Empiricism says that knowledge can be derived through only through observation, uh, scientific observation. And rationalism would say that we can take knowledge that we gain through observation and uh, think about it and gain even more knowledge. So basically, rationalism and empiricism reject any sort of religious sources of knowledge in favor of scientific sources. So they do take an affirmative stance that says that religious knowledge is not useful. The second theme is a belief in unguided evolution. The three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, all believe in a God that created mankind. So therefore, even if humanists are not atheists necessarily, they do reject the God of Abraham. So they do take an affirmative stance on this issue. Uh, my point here being that since Congress is to make no law respecting the establishment of a religion, if Congress were to allow any state to endorse secular humanism, then they would be making a law regarding the establishment of religion. Next, we'll examine some United States court cases, first regarding religion generally, and uh, most of the cases will be specifically about secular humanism. First, we're going to talk about a case that shows the scope of what can be considered a religion for legal purposes, and next we'll focus on cases specifically about secular humanism. The first case, United States v. Calton, is a Supreme Court case from the World War II era, and it's about a soldier who didn't want to serve in war uh, based on a conscientious objection to violence and warfare. The court said that in order to avail himself of this privilege, a registrant must establish that his objection to participation in war is due to religious training and belief. And the most important part of this is that the court went on to say that a compelling voice of conscience should be regarded as a religious impulse, and thus such an objection would fit the requirements for conscientious objectorship. Um, Cowton, in this case, didn't subscribe to any particular religion, but his objection was based on a compelling voice of conscience. So in this case, the court takes a, uh, a broad operative stance of what should be considered a religion. It's basically, you could also call it a functional stance. If his belief functions as a religion, then they will consider it a religious impulse. So this case gives a very broad definition as to what legally could be considered a religion. And such a broad definition would encompass secular humanism. The next case is Fellowship of Humanity versus County of Alameda, which is a California Court of Appeals case. A humanist organization that did not specifically say that they were secular humanist uh, appealed for a county tax exemption on the basis that they were a religious organization. Uh, it's a 501c3 tax exemption, which applies to both religious and educational usage. And the court granted the tax exemption for the organization, although the organization was not theistic. So this also sort of uses the, the broad definition of religion, as we saw in the United States versus Calton. And this case would indicate that secular humanism is a religion for legal purposes since they were granted the tax exemption. As we will see in a later case, uh, those who do not think that secular humanism should be deemed to be a religion have argued that this case, Fellowship of Humanity versus County of Alameda, uh, that the Fellowship of Humanity could have been granted their tax exemption just on an educational basis, and that this decision did not necessarily deem Fellowship of Humanity to be a religion. In this next case, Torcaso v. Watkins, is a United States Supreme Court case, and this seems to be one of the most cited cases regarding whether secular humanism is a religion. Um, Maryland had a law requiring that anyone holding a public office must believe in God, and a notary public in Maryland refused to take an oath that he believed in God, and so the state tried to prevent him from becoming a notary. Uh, the Supreme Court held that no state may require a religious test for candidates for public office, and that was the primary holding of the case. In a footnote, Justice Hugo Black wrote that secular humanism is among the religions in the United States that do not teach a belief in God. Justice Black's statement also included in that list uh, Buddhism and Hinduism just because their belief in God is non-traditional by our American standards. But the important part is that this footnote statement was made obiter dictum, meaning that it was just part of a, uh, a reasoning or an elaboration on an idea and was not intrinsic to the matter at hand and therefore would not be binding case law. 
However, Justice Black's statement does indicate at least some support from the Supreme Court for the idea that secular humanism is a religion. So once again, these three cases, the Calton case, the Fellowship of Humanity case, and the Torcaso case, all indicate that secular humanism could be considered a religion for legal purposes. Um, and then once again, in the Calton case, it's important to note that the Supreme Court takes a functional interpretation of religion as opposed to a strict interpretation. If the court had taken a strict interpretation of religion, that would mean that only theistic organizations such as the Christian Church would be considered a religion for legal purposes. Next, we're going to examine some cases that would indicate that secular humanism is not a religion. In Pelosa versus Capistrano Unified School District, uh, a teacher in California objected to the idea of teaching evolution in schools, saying that it violated his religious liberties, forcing him to teach what he called evolutionism. The court rejected that, and in their opinion, they stated that the Supreme Court has never ruled that secular humanism is a religion for the purposes of the Establishment Clause. According to Nadine Stosen, former president of the American Civil Liberties Union, those who defend the public school's inclusion of allegedly secular humanist teachings contend that it is not a religion and that its teachings neither inhibit nor advance any religion. Ms. Stosen's statement was based on the... Uh, the accusation that evolutionism is supposedly a secular humanist ideal. Her objection was that evolution is simply based on science and objectivity and that it is not a religious teaching and that including secular humanist ideals such as a belief in evolution is not a violation of the Establishment Clause of the Constitution. Ms. Stosen goes on to note that if we were to follow the logic of the critics of secular humanism here, we would have to also include the teaching of creation science in public schools, and that itself would violate the Establishment Clause, because including the teaching of creation science would amount to a government endorsement of a biblical view of the development of humanity. The next case, Kalka vs. Hawk, is about a prisoner who wanted to create an American Humanist Association chapter in his prison pursuant to his religious freedom. Other prisoners are allowed to practice Christianity or Islam or Judaism or whatever else may be considered a religion, but the court in this case did not allow the prisoner to create his humanist organization. That would indicate that the court did not consider humanism to be a religion. They stated that there was no establishment of a test for what constitutes a religion, so there is no clear violation of law. The court also addressed Hugo Black's footnote in the Torcaso case, where Justice Black stated that secularism is, uh, secular humanism is considered to be a religion amongst religions that don't teach a traditional belief in God. The Kalka Court came to the conclusion that Justice Black's statement regarding secular humanism in his footnote does not mean that secular humanism is a religion for the purposes of the Establishment Clause of the Constitution. Both the Pelosa and Kalka cases indicate that secular humanism is not a religion for legal purposes. Uh, the Pelosa case, if you remember, was the one about the teacher who objected to teaching evolutionism uh, and alleged that it was a secular humanist ideal. And the Kalka court stated that we have no test to determine what legally constitutes a religion. So at best, we have uh, fuzzy and disagreeing rulings as to whether secular humanism is or is not a religion. And the Supreme Court has not yet directly addressed the issue, so... The issue of whether secular humanism is a religion for the purposes of the Establishment Clause is still very much up in the air as far as the Supreme Court is concerned. The final part of this presentation will deal with policy considerations regarding secular humanism and the separation of church and state. My main argument here is going to be that we should take the broad functional definition of a religion from the United States v. Calton case, the Supreme Court case regarding the conscientious objector, and if we apply that to the separation of church and state, then we will see that any full belief system which qualifies as a comprehensive doctrine, which I will explain in this section, should qualify as a religion for the purposes of the Establishment Clause and thus should be subject to the separation of church and state. According to philosopher John Rawls, a comprehensive doctrine is any belief system that covers all recognized virtues and values within one precisely articulated scheme of thought. Secular humanism definitely fits this description, as would Christianity 
or Judaism, or Islam, or even non-traditional religions, uh, non-traditional by the Western standard, such as Hinduism and Buddhism. According to Sebastiano Maffetone, Rawls believes that if we think of our society as a community united in affirming one and the same comprehensive doctrine, then the oppressive use of state power is necessary for political community, meaning that if the state is to endorse any one comprehensive doctrine, then we can no longer have individual liberty, as the state will have to work to actively enforce that viewpoint. As a liberal democratic society, we do not permit the state to use coercive force to manufacture consensus regarding any one belief system. Uh, what we allow is a plurality of belief systems, and that is why we have the separation of church and state. If we did not have the separation of church and state, then we would allow the state to endorse any belief system that it saw fit. And if the state endorsed one belief system, then it would be excluding all of the other belief systems that would compete with it. And so, as John Rawls has said, uh, paraphrased here in the third point by Sebastiano Maffetone, an overlapping consensus of different belief systems from different comprehensive doctrines is the best way to determine policy and achieve stability in a liberal society, liberal democratic society. So, according to Rawls, we should take the points that we can all agree on and that we should uh, not write off any one doctrine or endorse any one doctrine. According to Professor Robert Audi of Notre Dame University, the reason that we have the Establishment Clause in the Constitution in the first place is because a democratic state should protect the liberty of its citizens and accordingly should accommodate both religious liberty and cultural diversity in religion and in other realms of life. If the state is willing to endorse any one comprehensive doctrine above any other, then that action would amount to an intolerance of diversity in religion and a lack of individual liberty for individual citizens. As long as the state refuses to endorse any one comprehensive doctrine, then we can ensure freedom of thought for each citizen and the right of each citizen to not have his beliefs dictated to him by the state. So in conclusion, if we apply the Supreme Court's broad and functional definition of religion as set out in the United States versus Calton, then we can prevent the state from endorsing any one comprehensive doctrine and thus preserving freedom of thought for each individual citizen to determine his own belief system and how to best adhere to it.